PR. So let's start here. Ventilation and how wise or stupid are we actually? What have we learned? First of all, this is not new. There is actually descriptions in the Bible of a saint or a person blowing air into a small child, reviving the child. And the Egyptian goddess Isis revived her husband Osiris in Egypt. And I must say, Isis was a very, very I was an intelligent and bright woman. She actually also put him together. He was hacked to death. And all of his pieces were thrown around all of Egypt. She got them back and saw him back to one piece again. So she was quite skilled. And here is kind of interesting. In the year 177, there is actually a Greek um, scientist, Galen. He performed a thoracotomy on a pig, put down a tube, and ventilated the pig for a period. Year 177. What have we learned so far? I mean, we've used different methods over time. We have used inverse CPR, we have used heat, witchcraft, external stimuli, use of bellows, rectal fumigation, and mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing. Some of them a bit stupid, yes. Let's start by looking at hanging. It was very popular in Egypt over 3,500 years before Christ, and it actually got popular in Europe at the end of the 1770s. We hanged people head down, and we started to squeeze the body here. Did it work? Probably not. Stupid? Maybe. In the Middle Ages, we tried heating the body. I mean, it's kind of logic. People get cold when they die, and if we heat the bodies, maybe we can reverse this process. Did it work? Probably not. Witchcraft, I have no idea exactly what they did. I know that there were over 500,000 people in Europe getting busted because of witchcraft and sentenced to death. So they must have done something. Did it work? I am not sure. Probably not. External stimuli. From the 500th century to the 1500th century, and then a revival at 1860 to 1960 was external stimuli. We tried yelling, slapping, spanking, flogging, external heating ones again, rolling of a barrel, straps on the back of a horse that ran across a field. Oh, some of them might work a bit, some maybe not. Just yelling, I don't think that it's too effective. Rectal fumigation. On the first thought, maybe really, really stupid, but on the other hand, maybe there was something behind it. Um, it was the American Indians who started this. Um, they used smoke signs, they used rectal fumigation. I don't know, they like smoke. Uh, the American settlers saw what they were doing, brought it back to Europe. In Europe, we have all and the drowning victims in London for most and in Amsterdam and Holland. They were building huge, or not huge, but organizations to save these drowning victims. And they were thinking, mm, maybe this might work. Uh, you were supposed to blow out some smoke into a urinary bladder of an animal. That was connected to a small hose, as you can see. And the smoke was then pushed into the rectum of the drowned victims. Stupid? Oh, maybe, but nicotine is actually a vasoconstrictor. Does it help? Not alone, but we're pushing adrenaline and norepinephrine in our patients today, so maybe. It was abandoned in 1811. There was a doctor that could show that 110 grams 
of tobacco snuff could kill a dog, and 30 grams of tobacco snuff could kill a cat. So people realized that this was maybe a bit dangerous, so it was a ban. Bellows. This was a common household tool already in the 15th century. Philippus von Hornheim wrote about the use of a bellows to resuscitate people. And this is not really stupid, actually. It's, I would say, a variant of a Bagwell mask. But in 1829, Le Roi d'Etoile demonstrated that over distension of the lungs could kill an animal. What he did was he put a small animal and put a bellow inside and blew as much as he could and the animal exploded. Really, really, really dangerous. We gotta stop this. So it got abandoned. And the abandonment might be stupid because that's not how we use it. He instead presented a technique using the arms of a patient. This was in the beginning and at the end of the 18th century. We know that we also use mouth to mouth. As I said in Egypt, in the Bible, we know that William Tossach at 1732 used mouth to mouth to rescue a coal miner. This fell out of favor at the 1770s as Shiela, he discovered oxygen and they realized that we use air and when we, or we use oxygen and when we breathe out, there might be uh, just air without oxygen. So we shouldn't push that air into other people. So mouth to mouth was abandoned due to that fact. Uh, or actually not a fact, but a belief. Stupid? Mm, maybe. And then the chest pressure method takes over and is used for about 100 years. The mouth to mouth method got arrived in the 1950s. We have a father of CPR, I was almost say from Austria, Peter Safar, he proved that expelled air had sufficient amount of oxygen. Uh, he could show that intubation and ventilation by mouth of Bagwells was possible. Uh, in the beginning, our rescue breath initially was about one to two liters. We're kind of close to the animal that exploded, but maybe not yet. We have a short movie. and curarizing these subjects in order to simulate limp asphyxia victims. Third, by having untrained lay personnel perform some of these methods. And fourth, by not using an endotracheal tube. To help orient you, we have made a diagram of the experimental setup. Here the volunteer, the victim, a rescuer, an anesthesia machine for inflation of the victim's lungs with oxygen before and after performance of ineffective methods of artificial respiration. Here an ear oximeter, which indicates relative arterial oxygen saturation. A carbon dioxide analyzer, a blood pressure cuff, an intravenous infusion set for the administration of drugs. We used one or the other of the following two instruments for measuring tidal volumes of respiration. A pneumograph, volumetrically calibrated during performance of the mouth-to-mouth -mouth methods. Now the subject is being rendered unconscious by the intravenous injection of one milligram of scopolamine and by several doses of meperidine. After 20 minutes he will have received 300 milligrams of meperidine and will no longer respond to verbal stimuli. 
Now he is unconscious. Watch the breathing bag and the position of the head. With the head extended, chin up, the bag is moving freely. With the neck flexed, chin down, the pharynx is obstructed, the bag does not move. Now, succinylcholine, a curare-like agent, is given by continuous intravenous trip. All muscles, including the respiratory muscles, will remain paralyzed for the next three hours. The subject is paralyzed in apneic. Intermittent positive pressure breathing is performed by manual compression of the breathing bag. Now the head is extended and you see good chest motion and excursions of the pneumograph. Now the chin is dropped and no exchange. Again, extension of the head, good exchange. The mask fit is checked for leaks by compression of the breathing bag. No gas escapes, therefore we may connect to the spirometer. First we study the chest pressure method with the subject in the supine position. There is no artificial airway in place. Note the position of the head. It is not held in extension. The spirometer tracing in the corner shows zero exchange. Try to follow the ink writer indicated by the arrow in the corner. Watch closely when the chin is pulled up, a tidal volume of 180 milliliters will follow. Chin up. Now. Subsequent tidal volumes, however, diminish in size and finally, again zero exchange because the chin dropped. The next method we are going to study is the chest pressure arm lift method, also called the Sylvester method. The rescuer is performing 12 cycles per minute. The subject's head is placed in extension and an artificial oropharyngeal airway is in place, which prevents obstruction by the lips and teeth and also holds the tongue forward. With these optimal airway conditions, you can see that the spirometer indicates tidal volumes of 280 to 340 milliliters. Unfortunately, in two of our nine subjects, studied with this chin-up position plus an airway, all tidal volumes were smaller than the estimated dead space air. Now we will... So, I got to show this because it's, it's brilliant. First of all, those of you that actually are from Australia, you should be proud. He's from Australia, or maybe you all know it, but there are many of us that think he is from America. Uh, Peter Safar, the American guy. Well, no, 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 he's from Austria, he's from Vienna. Um, he went to America and he made these studies. They look kind of simple, but they were at their time brilliant because he could actually show that all these other methods were stupid. You could push the chest as much as you want, nothing happens. So he would, I, I would say that he's the father of more or less the modern way of how we perform CPR. There were these old, the other three guys, Kovenhoven, Nickerbrock, and, and Jude, but I would say these experiments were actually the first ones and really, really showed that there was actually just one way to do this. So, we've gone from something that was maybe a bit stupid to something that was not as stupid as before, but we're not there yet. I would say. I mean, I started to talk about the stupidity of mankind, and we should not be complacent and say, well, now we know it all. He showed us the truth. No, we're not. Let's go through the recommendations today. The European Resuscitation Council says adult CPR tide volumes about five to 600 mils. It's about six to seven mils per kilo. This is the volume required to cause the chest to rise visibly. First of all, six 
to 7 mils per kilo, is it actual body weight or ideal body weight? That's interesting to see how they think, but I'm not really sure. Inflation duration is about one second. Enough volume to make the victim's chest rise, but avoid rapid or forceful breaths. Maximum interruption in chest compression to give two breaths should not exceed 10 seconds. It takes about 15 seconds to lose flow and pressure in the coronary arteries, so it's really, really important to not interrupt too long. And these recommendations apply to all forms of ventilation during CPR when the airway is unprotect unprotected, including mouth-to-mouth -mouth and bag mask ventilation with and without supplemental oxygen. These are the recommendations. If you uh, have an advanced airway, you can give them 10 breaths per minute during continuous chest compressions. The pulse for intubation should be less than five seconds. Ventilate the lungs and breath 10 per minute. Do not hyperventilate the patient. If you use an supraglottic airway, LMA, or something in that area, that is an acceptable alternative. Once that has been inserted, attempt to deliver continuous chest compression, uninterrupted by ventilation. If excessive leakage, use 32. But what do we know to actually say that this is the right way? Yeah, we know that the frequency is often higher than stated in guidelines when performed by trained personnel in the States. And 2004, it was not uncommon with about 30 breaths per minute. There is an inverse relationship between frequency and coronary perfusion pressure, which is extremely important for outcomes. So don't ventilate too quick. No assisted ventilation during CPR is okay, okay for bystanders and difficult airways. Ventilation and compressions are actually, though, better than no ventilation CPR. And it's important to remember that LMA compared to intubation success rate in one study was about 95% compared to 70%. And the LMA might increase risk of gastric insufflation, which could affect intrathoracic pressure and venous return negatively. Although there are some retrospective studies showing an increase in mortality when intubation has been performed during CPR. So don't forget that. Intubation is not always the way to s save a person. So, do we know the optimal tidal volume? No, we don't. Do we know the optimal frequency of ventilation? No, we don't. Do we know how to optimally secure the airway? I'm sorry, we don't. So, what have we actually learned from all this? I'm not the one to tell you. We have speakers coming after me, maybe going into this a bit more. And by that, I will just uh, thank you for listening and hope that the next speakers will give you more uh, of the truth that lies behind this. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Um, there's some of those methods there that I definitely don't think we're going to take, bring back into practice. Hope um, not. Are there any questions from the floor? So I've got a question for you. Yes. Um, obviously. Um, so one of the things that was talked about was those different methods of uh, uh, respiration early on and many of those are due to uh, compression of the chest and altering the way that the, the chest moves and creating tidal volumes. Um, small story, last year I was actually involved in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest as just walking along the street and the chap had blood all over his face so I remembered the paper that said you can just do chest compression only because there's enough ventilation there. Has that been looked at? Do we know how much ventilation you get just by doing external chest compressions? Peter Safar, in the movie, yeah. he measured uh, tidal volumes and they were too small. Um, there is maybe an idea or an perception that if you, if you use mechanical chest compressions, you might increase the, the ventilation part uh, compared to manual chest compression. 
I'm not sure. It has not been looked into thoroughly. Um, we might do it very soon. I suppose it relates to the question about Peter Safar's work showed that there was a difference in the volumes. The question is, how much is enough in the CPR phase before the next level of the chain of survival arrives? Yeah. You know, is one or two hundred mils enough, or do we really need that five, six hundred mils? Now it gets really complicated because <laughs> we have to oxygenate the patient, or oxygenate the brain, I would say. Uh, so we have to give them some amount of oxygen that actually reads the alveoli and then goes out into the bloodstream. If we use the simple kind count of 2.2 mils per kilo, which would be the, I mean, the amount that just gives uh, dead space ventilation we would have to have ventilation that is larger than that. But how much larger? No idea. But I would say at least 2.2 mil or per kilo and over that would give some point of oxygenation of the patient. But we don't know how often we have to do, give this rescue breath at all. No idea. I mean, for five minutes or maybe up to 10 minutes, it could be okay to just compress. There is so much that we don't know yet, so um, this is a field that needs exploring much, much more before we can say anything, I would say. And there are